Welcome to today's episode. Today I wanted to talk about expert swimmer myths. Now, the reason why this is an important topic is because we have all kinds of thoughts about something um, that we want to try something new. If you want to come new to swimming or new to snorkeling or um, you feel like there's an area you want to learn or improve or make changes, you have lots of thoughts about it that you think are like just the way it is, that it is the rule. And um, oftentimes these are just thoughts that are really occur in our head and aren't necessarily even true. And when we want to make change, we really have to start with our thoughts and beliefs. So that's why today's episode is really important because I give you an opportunity to have a new view on some thoughts and beliefs you might have about swimming. And you might be saying to yourself, I, in order to be a good swimmer, I have to be X, Y, Z, you know, fill in the blank. So let's go through a few of these. Um, I really got inspired by one of my students who noticed that. She says, I, you know, and she's now a very good swimmer. And she says, these are things I just didn't know about. And I thought I had to be like this in order to be a good swimmer. So, come on, little turtle. I just love this guy. <laughs> Let's look at some myths. The first one is that expert swimmers take flotation with them. I mean, here we have our lifeguard. You've seen an image like this before. You've probably seen a lifeguard at a pool or a beach, and they always have a flotation device with them. And this is actually in the rules. It is the rule that lifeguards are not allowed to go in and make a rescue without taking a flotation device. And so these are swimming professionals. So we can kind of say they're expert swimmers, right? And um, yet it is a rule that they have to always take a piece of flotation device with them. You know, it doesn't make you wrong or less of a swimmer. I just love this guy, you know, this little water rescue guy taking his flotation device not only with him, but on him. Um, so it's really about making sure that you kind of have this out. It's not a big deal. It doesn't, um, you know, say something bad about you. We have a lot of people who say, you know, oh, all the good swimmers or people who are swimmers can just like go in freely and they never wear a life jacket. But the truth is that people <clears throat> take flotation devices with them, even really good expert swimmers. This is normal. All right, and another one is that expert swimmers don't swim in all water. You know, it's not like, um, in, like in this picture, being in the water really isn't a swimming problem. It's a temperature problem, right? These guys, they're in heavy jackets and and they have personal flotation devices on, life jackets on, and because um, they don't want to end up in this water. And <clears throat> it's not whether or not they're a good or bad swimmer. It's about what your body can handle. And there are places that you don't swim. You know, there are rapidly moving rivers that you don't swim in. You know, I learned this when we were in um, Yosemite and getting a presentation by the rescue team about the different kinds of rescues that happen in that park. And of course, water rescues is one of the things that they do, or they do recoveries. And um, they said there are times when the water is such that they do not go in to recover a body, even though they know it's very useful for the family and they really want to be able to do that, but they're not going to put themselves at risk. When water has lots and lots of air in it, the flotation principles are not the same as it is in still water or water that doesn't have air in it. And um, so even our very highest trained swimmers, expert rescue swimmers, say, no, the earth's water that you don't go in. So it's really about knowing who you are, what your level of swimming is, what you're capable of staying calm, cool, and collected for, so you can understand how your body and the water work together. This is really important. And for each person, it's a different level. 
I'm an expert swimmer, but even if this was um, water available for a professional rescuer to go in, I wouldn't go in because I don't have that kind of training. Doesn't make me less of a swimmer, doesn't say anything bad about me. There's an area of opportunity to learn if I desire. <clears throat> Another thing is that expert swimmers, they wear life jackets or personal flotation devices. That's the other word you'll hear it called, PFDs. You know, um, <clears throat> this guy's out kayaking on a river. Great sport, great activity. But, you know, he's got his life jacket on. He even has his helmet on. Um, if he, and this goes to show he's in a place where he could have a head injury. You have a head injury, it doesn't matter how good of a swimmer you are. Um, you, it's like wearing a seatbelt uh, when you're in the car. Most of the time, don't need it. The time comes that you need it, you're really glad you have it. Doesn't mean anything about anything bad about him or making him less than. It actually tells us, oh, this is a person that knows how to take care. This is a person who knows how to be safe and have a good time to be safe and participating, right? Water skiing, another example, universally. I mean, it's the law in the U.S. that you have to wear a personal flotation device if you're being towed behind a boat, um, if you're in a jet ski. So there are times where it is so important because of injury, um, the possibility of head injury that you need to be wearing a life jacket. We've codified it. So if you have an idea that, gosh, somehow only the, you know, the cool kids aren't wearing life jackets, I shouldn't be wearing one either. I'm not really a good swimmer. I'm not really, can't really fully participate if I wear a life jacket. No, this is simply just thoughts that you're having in your head, not based in any sort of truth. Another one, stand-up paddle boarding. You know, this is, um, it's required that you have a life jacket with you when you're on a stand-up paddle board. You know, when I'm out paddle boarding and I'm in a place that there isn't a lot of boats and I'm planning on swimming, I'm planning on being in the water, the water temperature is good for swimming, the air temperature is good, the situation is all right. Maybe I, I only have my board leashed to me so I don't lose my board. But the weather's cold. I don't want to be, I'm not planning on swimming. There's lots of boat traffic, all these kinds of things. I absolutely 100% have my life jacket on. Um, it doesn't make me any less of a swimmer. It makes me smart. <laughs> um, <clears throat> here's another myth that um, you should be able to like just handle it on your own. Even expert swimmers have lifeguards or have somebody looking out for them or have another set of eyes. When you talk about people who swim long distances, like across the English Channel or um, these different open water kinds of events, there is always somebody watching. There is always somebody who has a larger, broader view. There's somebody there for support. Does it mean any of these people are less of swimmers? Absolutely not. Does it mean that they're challenging their bodies and they're going, maybe pushing their limits in a way that is fun and adventurous to them and you want to make sure you have support when you do that? Yes. So you, it's not like you have to go out and gut it out and be able to do this all on your own. It is wise and smart to have lifeguards. <laughs> Have somebody with you. All right, and here's one more. Is um, expert swimmers don't necessarily hold their breath for a long time. You know, I have a lot of beginner swimmers who are like, should I practice holding my breath? Or I can't hold my breath for very long. You know, what is, um, how long, you know, should I breathe every three strokes or something? No, expert swimmers just get air when they want air. They listen to their body. Your body tells you when you would like to exchange your air. They're not trying to hold it for long periods of time when they're just in recreationally swimming. Now, they may um, hold their breath 
for a long time because they're in training and building up some cardiovascular um, sort of, you know, in the way that they're just building that stamina of their body. But this is when you're talking about advanced sports, right? Um, like somebody who does long distance biking or um, running or something like that. When you're at that stage of the game, they, you might be building your lung capacity and you might be doing things where you are holding your breath. But this is, again, it serves a very specific purpose for distance fitness or speed fitness. It has nothing at all to do with recreational swimming, being safe in deep water, being able to be comfortable in the water, have fun, play with your family, enjoy vacations. None of that requires you holding your breath for a long time. And expert swimmers don't even think about it. They just take some air, they go under, they do what they're gonna do, come up and have an exchange of air, and they decide, that's plenty of time. If that was 10 seconds, 20 seconds, a minute, whatever it was, I can guarantee you they're not counting it unless they're having a holding breath contest with their kids. Right. Hopefully you learned some interesting things there to help you um, start to change your narrative around what it means to be a swimmer. Um, come join us over in our Foundations of Change, where we do a deep dive into the three by five of the foundation to be able to change what you want in your life. That it really starts with this idea of what it means to be you and your thoughts and your feelings and how that influences your actions that you have in life. And <clears throat> this takes us to our learning. So jump on over, come at orcaswimschool.com. Subscribe to the YouTube page here so you know um, each week when we release new episodes and um, or pop on over and join our membership. Thanks.